Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the webinar. Uh, we're talking about writing about the body. Sorry, my name is Jessica Walton. Um, I'm the author of a picture book, Introducing Teddy. Um, I do a lot of writing about my body, my disability, my pain. Um, none of it published yet. So um, I'm there with you trying to write and um, explore my writing before I send it out, out into the world. Um, today we're talking about um, writing about the body. So I've sent out a handout that I'm hoping um, most of you have had a chance to look at, but if you haven't, don't worry, there will be some time for you to have a look through the material during the webinar. Um, the handout includes some excerpts from poetry and also um, an article and uh, we've got some quotes. There's lots of things to get you thinking um, about language and about your body and how you might describe certain things that are happening in your body. Uh, I wanted to start first of all by, by talking about the importance of disability representation in writing um, and I thought I would illustrate how difficult it is to find yourself in books by showing you the first book that I ever found an amputee in. Uh, this is The Wonky Donkey by Craig Smith. Um, and this is one of my son's favourite, sorry, my, one of my three-year-old son's favourite books to read. Um, the, I'll show you the page where it becomes apparent that the wonky donkey is an amputee. Every time we get to this page, my son says, just like mummy. Um, so as you can see, the donkey has a prosthetic leg. Um, so that's the extent currently of my representation in picture books. I have found a few um, self-published books by amputees. Uh, I'm building a collection, uh, but this is the, the only one by a mainstream publisher that I've been able to find so far with an amputee in it. Um, any suggestions, very welcome. Um, and I thought I would show you an example of a, a picture book um, that has really good disability representation as well. This one is Teddy Took the Train by Nikki Greenberg. Uh, and this one, the story is about a little girl and her teddy bear, um, but the mum in the story is a wheelchair user. Um, so I'm just trying to find, here we go. Um, so there's a picture of the mum in the story. Um, the fact that she's a wheelchair user is not actually part of the story. It's not, um, the story is not about her using a wheelchair and it's not really mentioned in the story at all. It's just part of the illustrations. Um, and I think it's a really good example of the kind of books that I'm that I'm now looking for. I do want picture books that are about disability, um, but I also want books like this that just happen to have disabled characters in them. Um, so as a picture book writer, this is one of my passions, um, looking for picture books that have um, disability rep in them. Uh, and some of you might be um, aspiring picture book writers or published pic picture book writers. So um, there will be a lot of us who are from different writing backgrounds or who um, write with different forms and genres. Um, so hopefully there'll be um, space for everyone to write about the kinds of things that they're interested in writing about today. So the handout that I sent out, um, I hope that you're, you've all got that in front of you. Uh, I think it was emailed out to participants. Um, if you don't have a copy, I'll just read out the excerpts from the poems that we're looking at today. Um, the first one is by Tom Andrews um, from the Haemophiliacs Motorcycle, um, page 61. I'll just give everyone a moment if you do have the file, if you've been emailed the file, I'll just give you a moment to um, open that up. If anyone doesn't know how to access that, just um, let me know through the chat and we'll see if we can organise a copy for you. So hopefully you're all opening that. Uh, I've got someone who doesn't have a copy, they're checking their email now. What I might do is see if I can get a copy um, open on the screen. One moment. Um, could you read us and Claire if we could get a copy of the handout open on the screen? Okay, so we'll see if we can get a copy of that open on the screen for you so you can have a look. Um, but I'll just give everyone a chance to, to look at their email and see if they've got it. Yeah. 
Box. Okay, so apparently you can ask questions in the questions box. Uh, we are having some internet issues with some of our participants, um, so I've just been asked to slow it down a little bit. So we might just give everyone a bit of time to um, have a look at the handout if you've got it open on email. We're also trying to get it open on the screen here so you can have a look. Um, and hopefully that will give everyone a chance um, if they're having internet issues to resolve those. So can they see my screen? Um, they should be able to see both. So this is what they can see. Right? It's kind of cute. Can you see So they can see it there? Yes, yeah, so yep. they can see the handout. Okay, so hopefully you can all see the handout on the screen. So I'll just give you, if anyone is having trouble seeing that on the screen, just let me know. So I'll just read out the first one too, just in case you are either having trouble seeing it on the screen um, or opening it on email. The first one is The Haemophiliacs Motorcycle by Tom Andrews. There are times in the last minutes before I am allowed or allow myself more coding when the pain inside the joints simplifies me utterly. I become as crude and guileless as an amoeba. The pain is not personal. I am incidental to it. It is like faith. The believer eclipsed by something immense. Okay, so we've just got a message here. Um, apparently everyone can open the handout by going to the handouts panel. So hopefully whether it's by email or through the handouts pane or um, on the screen, hopefully all of you can see the handout. Okay, I'll try reading out the second excerpt. This is from I Give a Cosmic Middle Finger by Marlena Chertok. The black hole in my lower left back wants to swallow me whole, but I'm trying to have more good days than dark. My back sucks my energy like a fat leech living in my spine. I'll just explain the reason I've chosen excerpts um, are about pain is that um, something I live with as well as an amputated leg is chronic back pain um, and I find it quite difficult to describe the sensations that I have. Um, I have spasms, I have things that throb, things that, um, that are really sharp, different kinds of pain in different places at different times. Um, so what I'm trying to do is um, uh, show the way that different writers with a disability have described living with pain. Um, so we can have a look at the vocabulary that they've used and maybe use that as a way to think about how we might describe um, any kind of physical experience in our own bodies. So thinking of unusual ways to describe either pain or some other kind of sensation that you might have in your body or some other thing that you experience. Um, so I'll read the third one now. This is Extramarital Bliss by J.V. Birth. I have affairs with ice. It numbs the tree ablaze on my back. Branches sear my shoulders, scorch their way up my neck, the fiery heart of it blasting against my thoracic part, while the rest of my vertebrae lean slightly off centre as if trying to escape the backdraft. My spine longs to be a sigh, rather than a question left hanging, where nerves fizz and spit through spaces too tight, waiting for that awkward move, that twist too far to bring my world screaming back to me. Okay, so those are the, the excerpts that I've chosen for today. Uh, we might just check in 
to see if, are we still having issues with internet connection from those? Okay. Um, I just don't want to move too far ahead um, before we've got um, the group in Ballarat online with us. Not sure? Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so hopefully we've got everyone here and the connections are working um, and hopefully you've all got a copy of the handout um, open now. What I might do is close the, the handout on my screen uh, and what I thought we'd do to start with is try, um, if you have a pen and paper with you or a computer that you can write on, um, if you can write down any words that jumped out at you from those excerpts or little snippets of phrases um, that you found interesting or unusual. And you can either write it as a list or you can do what I've done here, which is sort of creating a bit of a, a concept map. So I'm spacing them out on the page so I can then make connections from that. Let me just make sure I've got that on screen. Um, so I can make connections from that when I come up with my own ideas. So what I've got here, let's stand up so I can describe this. Um, so I've, I've got uh, some of the words that have been used to describe things that are happening uh, in the writer's body. So we've got nerves that are fizzing and spitting. We've got a spine that is a sigh or that longs to be a sigh rather than a question left hanging. We've got pain as something immense that may eclipse you. We've got lower left back pain described as a black hole that can swallow you whole. We've got the back described as a fat leech that sucks energy. Um, the poet describes themselves as an amoeba crude and guileless. And we've got back pain described as a tree ablaze and as branches that sear and scorch. So they were the things that jumped out to me as um, interesting descriptions of what was happening in the poet's bodies. Okay, so you could try and create something like that. You don't have to put all of those things on your sheet, just include the ones that are interesting to you. Um, you might include more than that. There might be other things that jumped out at you. So I'll just have a look at the questions. Okay. Uh, someone has asked if this recording will be saved um, for you to listen to later and apparently yes, it will be sent later. Uh, and Caitlin says, uh, my si spine longs to be a sigh is beautiful. I agree. Um, so from this activity, uh, what I'm hoping that we'll be able to do is make some connections between the ways that these poets have described their pain um, and the way that we might like to describe something that's happening in our body. Um, so you might be someone who does experience pain, so you might choose to do this activity with that in mind, um, or you might choose to write about something else. So you may or may not identify as someone with a disability. Um, if you don't, then you might write about something else that has happened in your body, whether that be um, the experience of pregnancy or childbirth, or um, the experience of growing bigger, from uh, going from being a child to being an adult, um, you might write about puberty. Um, you might write about um, what it feels like to sit on a particular kind of chair, or you know, it doesn't have to be. Um, it doesn't have to be about pain. It doesn't have to be about disability. Um, but what I'd like you to do is use this as a as a kind of springboard. So, how are you all going with? I know I've been talking at you. How are you all going with writing down the words and phrases that interest you? Does anyone have any favourites? I think fizz and spit is my favourite one, the nerves fizzing and spitting. Something about those words in my mouth that I love. Makes me think of, um, for some reason, snap, crackle and pop. So when I'm, when I'm looking at fizz and spit and I think, snap, 
crackle top. I've included that on my page with the line coming off from fizz and spit to show that that's something that I've come up with um, that's linked to fizz and spit. Uh, when I look at fat leech and amoeba and black hole and tree ablaze, I think what other objects um, could describe pain? And I'm reminded of the tulips um, poem by Sylvia Plath. Um, so I'm just going to write here the tulips. I don't know if anyone has read that poem, but um, Plath describes being in hospital and it's a very white environment, a very sterile environment, um, and some tulips are brought into the hospital and they're bright red, they're too red, um, and she describes their mouths opening um, and the red is disturbing the white and the peace and the blankness of that hospital environment. Um, and they're, they're described as dangerous animals, these tulips. So if we were to then include Plath's poem about tulips, then we would have some other descriptions, some interesting descriptions um, that we could kind of use as, a, as an inspiration for our own words. So you could go to any poem written by someone who has experienced something like pain or disability or hospitalisation and look at the ways that they have used interesting descriptions um, to, to talk about what's happening to them and to help the reader to understand what they're going through. Uh, Caitlin says, I like the idea of a question left hanging, very familiar for people with ambiguous illnesses or health conditions, as well as a good evocation of pain. Yes, I agree. Um, the I love the description of the um, the black holes swallowing me as well, and the idea of something immense eclipsing me. Um, I think that um, when I read that, that's something I identify with. Okay, so we've got here. Okay, um, so we've got a suggestion here um, that. Branches sear my shoulders. Um, the idea of um, a tree ablaze on, on my back and branches searing my shoulders could be sitting in connection with bright sunshine, that that could be a release to help find relief from branching pain. So we can draw that onto our, um, our concept map or our list. Um, so we've got the idea of a tree ablaze. So if we're thinking about trees and maybe tulips, um, other kind of objects or, or things in nature, something like sunshine um, kind of fits in with that landscape, that um, set of vocabulary. So sunshine as relief from branching pain. Uh, and in that same poem, the author describes using ice to numb pain as well. I don't know if you can see that. Sorry, I'm doing a terrible job of showing this on screen. Here we go. So we've now got the idea of sunshine as a relief from pain. Um, and we've got the tulips. Uh, what other things from nature might we include on this concept map if we were to write a poem about about pain or something else happening in the body. You can think of other kinds of weather that might link into this idea. So something like um, wind blowing pain away, um, or we might think of uh, you know ominous dark clouds as being a sign that pain is about to strike or that something is about to happen. Uh, we might think of the body as being like a field of grass, feeling a breeze that's kind of blowing across the grass or feeling the sunshine or feeling the rain. So, you, you know, you can think of the body as being something within nature too and the body is experiencing the elements that are kind of going on around it. Uh, if we go um, to the idea of the um, fat leech or the amoeba, um, what other animals or life forms could the body, sorry, they've got fat leech and amoeba here. Um, what other kinds of animals could um, describe either body parts or our body? 
or the pain itself. So it could be that um, the animal is us, or the animal is the pain, or the animal is um, something else that's going on in our body. If anyone wants to let me know what they're writing about, whether it's pain or something else, um, that would be really good too, because then I can try and draw that in this concept map. Okay, Stacy likes, it is like faith, the believer eclipsed by something immense. Such a unique way to express the power of the author's pain. Yes. Um, and I think that that's what I like too about the idea of the black hole. Um, it's something that we all understand as enormous and terrifying, difficult to understand. Um, the fact that it swallows things on a huge scale. Um, so it totally makes sense that if you have a black hole in your lower left back, you've got something huge and serious and, and terrifying going on in your back. Um, and the idea that there could be this site of pain in your body which is swallowing you, swallowing the rest of you whole. Um, I really like that imagery. Um, and that black hole imagery connects in really well with, um, with Tom Andrews' description of pain as something immense that eclipses you. So you can see these similar ideas kind of happening. The fat leech and the amoeba uh, feel linked to me. Um, so, yeah. so um, but here another suggestion that nature um, hears my pain and I don't feel as isolated. Um, and my world, the idea of my world screaming back to me, which is the last line of Extramarital Bliss by J.V. Birth. Um, so if we were to look at, oh, that, so we might add that to the, the concept map, the idea of the world screaming back to me. Um, and the idea of nature, nature hearing my pain. Okay, is there anything else that anyone else is enjoying in these excerpts or um, any ideas that are springing to mind as you read through these excerpts? So for me it was Snap, Crackle and Pop, which is obviously from um, the Rice Bubbles ad from when I was a kid. Um, and the, um, the idea of Plath's tulips. Um, and then I think, okay, how have I tried to describe my pain in the past when I've tried writing about it? And it's often um, uh, the idea of stabbing pain, so I'll often use the word um, stabbing, burning, throbbing, so they're all quite, um, these are the sort of words that I tend to use to describe my pain and I feel like I, I've overused them and like they're quite common words to use to describe pain um, and that might be, they might be useful when I'm describing my pain to a doctor um, but if they're, when I'm, I'm writing poetry, if they're words that people hear over and over again to describe pain then I might not be kind of cutting through um, to the reader. And, and I might not be sort of giving them enough to imagine. Um, so, I mean, they're all valid words to use. Any word that you use to describe what's happening in your body, if it's the right word for you to use, then it's the right word, regardless of whether it's been used a lot before. Um, and the reason that words are commonly used is because, um, you know, we, uh, some of us have similar experiences of pain. So a word like stabbing is very useful because, you know, in, immediately you have the image of knives stabbing. Um, it's a very evocative image. Um, but if I think about the kinds of pain that I experience, um, one of them is phantom pain. And I think phantom pain is a really interesting idea to write about because, um, you know, when I think about it, I'm like, it's happening outside of my body, outside the outlines of my body. So then I've thought of the word outlines, which makes me think of cookie cutters. Um, and it's a tingling kind of pain. So um, now I'm thinking of um, the nerves that are fizzing and spitting because the pain isn't just happening outside my body, it's happening in my mind and in my nerves. Um, 
I can feel a foot that was amputated 20 years ago. I can feel my big toe. So in a poem about pain, um, phantom pain is a really interesting idea to explore because it's so um, unknown. Um, we've got some questions coming through. Um, Carly says, it's hard to describe pain to doctors, let alone in a poetic way, but these ideas are useful. Um, makes me think now of um, uh, Leah Kaminsky has written an essay about being a doctor and um, trying to help patients describe pain to her um, and the way that often as a doctor they're trying to get someone to describe their pain quickly and efficiently so that they can understand, prescribe what they need, treat them and then you know, move on to the next patient and how sometimes the language is inadequate um, and going and looking at other people's description of their pain um, can be quite helpful both as a writer and as a doctor in terms of understanding the way that someone might be experiencing their body uh, and how they might describe it to her as a doctor or in a piece of poetry. Uh, Michelle has said, I often like pain, I liken pain to um, falling down a bottomless well. Just because I've stopped screaming, it doesn't mean I'm not still falling. It speaks to the relentlessness of it and also the idea that people often think we are not in pain or that we are coping better than we actually are. Yes. Um, and Carly says, I feel like I'm always aware of my body's feelings like wriggly creatures. That's great. I love that one. Okay. Um, Tully in Ballarat says, I see pain separate to myself. I meditate, put it in a backpack. Oh, I like that. And cover it in a blanket, absorb the warmth, lie down under a tree, and hang the backpack somewhere else. That's amazing. I love that imagery. And the fact that the, the imagery is quite poetic, but it's also useful in a very real way um, in someone's life um, in terms of coping with pain. Um, okay, is there anything else? I'll just make sure I haven't missed anyone else's comments. I love the idea of the body's feelings as wriggly creatures. I think that works beautifully and it ties into that, um, the imagery we had in those poems of the fat leech and the amoeba. Um, so what other wriggly creatures could we use in, in poetry or in writing to describe our pain or, or something else that's happening in our body? Uh, Jack says, it brings forward the questions about how we experience our bodies versus how the medical profession might view our bodies. It took me years to actually tap into how I actually experience my body and find a language for that. And that's what I'm really hoping um, to kind of start today is to give people, um, I mean, you might already have a vocabulary that you use to describe your body and your experiences, um, and that's great. Um, but a lot of us, when we sit down to write about um, disability or about our bodies, um, we're not quite sure where to start. And so that's when I tend to start writing about stabbing, throbbing and burning because, um, you know, those are the words that I know and those are the ones that I use in a medical context with a um, medical professional to describe what's happening in my body. Um, but I love this idea of just, you know, going into a doctor's office and saying, uh, my pain is like a black hole that's swallowing me whole. Um, my, my back is like a fat leech that's sucking the energy from the rest of my body. My back is a tree ablaze uh, with branches that sear and scorch. I love the idea of trying to get a medical professional to understand my pain in a more complex and interesting way. Um, Caitlin has said, we need time to be able to explain to ourselves as well as to others, including doctors, what our pain or other experiences are. We need to be given that respect. That's right. So um, I'm hoping that um, in building a, a different vocabulary to describe our bodies or something that's happening in our body, um, we will be able to kind of use this process of starting with a word like fizz and spit and then branching out from there and creating um, concept maps or lists of words um, that we can go to when we're writing. And eventually that process of thinking about an object, thinking, okay, my pain is like a tulip. Um, 
and then I think about a tulip opening up like a mouth, just like Plath described it. And then I might think of my pain as a mouth, a hungry mouth. And then I might think, okay, does the pain mouth have teeth in it? And, you know, uh, so if my pain is a mouth full of teeth, um, are the teeth eating me? Are they chewing? Are they cutting, stabbing? Can I bring some of those words in? Um, or if my pain is existing outside the outline of my body, then what other parts of me might exist outside that outline? Um, are able bodies like cookies made with a cookie cutter and my body doesn't fit into that kind of, um, you know, it's making me think of mass produced. Those are the words that are springing to mind. So starting with one image and then moving on from there and writing everything down as you go through that process to give yourself extra ideas and words to use in your writing. Uh, we've got a comment here from Ballarat. Um, so the Ballarat group have come up with some pain words, lightning, thunder, constant, dramatic and intense, invasive. Oh, I love invasive because then instantly I'm thinking of the pain as an invasion. Uh, I'm thinking of what else invades, armies, aliens, um, uh, what, are, what other words have we got here? Lightning and thunder. So pain as a storm. Um, so then we can think about other things that go on in a storm. Tornadoes, um, dark clouds, um, hail, the experience of hail falling against your skin or the sound of hail on a roof. So your body could be a tin roof. I don't know. I'm, this is the, the kind of thing I'm hoping to start off. Has anyone else got any other words that have come to mind or things that have jumped out from the poems. Uh, Michelle Roger says, pain for me is words written on viscera and bone. I carry it within always. It's just what I let others and sometimes even myself read that differs. So we've got, um, we've got pain as something you can um, put in a backpack and separate from yourself. And then we've got this other great image of pain as something, as words written on our bones, carrying it always. So here we have two completely different and almost opposite descriptions of pain that have come out of this workshop already. Um, pain is something that you can separate from yourself and put in a backpack um, and carry around, carry around or take off when you need to. Or words are something written on our bones that we carry always. So both, both of them are the idea of carrying, carrying our pain. Um, so I can see quite an amazing um, poem coming out of the two separate ideas. Um, we've also got pain as um, falling down a well. Falling down a well and the idea that you can't scream forever but you're still falling. The idea of how we communicate our pain um, to other people. So we've got here the idea of falling down a well um, and of course we've got the word screaming and extramarital bliss here. Um, the idea of uh, the awkward move, the twist too far that brings my world screaming back to me. So screaming is an effective, a word that comes up um, when we're talking about pain. Um, so Michelle talks about ripping and tearing, a desperate need to tear off my flesh at times to remove the offending parts. As an amputee, I'm loving that, that imagery, the idea of um, ripping and tearing. Um, Caitlin is talking about the question mark, its shape, the curve, the direction and diversion, and the small dot at the bottom. Is that me? This is amazing. Uh, Tully says, the sea comes to mind. It can be quite gentle or rough. It contains creatures such as sharks and octopuses. You can be washed up against the rocks or tangled in seaweed. 
So we've got this great um, image now of the sea. We've got um, ripping and tearing. Uh, so the sea can be uh, gentle or rough. And you've got creatures in the sea. So the, the sea is a, a really um, full landscape to kind of, we could, there's lots we could draw in there. There's the weather um, that we could draw into a poem using the sea. Um, you've got the creatures that you could pull into that poem. Um, you've got um, objects like rocks and seaweed. Um, Julianne says, I see my pain as a separate entity that wants me to do things I don't want to and control me. Um, so you've got potentially a whole character starting to form, pain as a character separate to yourself. So then you could um, create a conversation between you and pain or a fight. Um, so pain as a person or a monster or, um, or a creature um, that is trying to control you. Um, you could have a supernatural creature of some kind. Uh, it's making me think of those creatures from Harry Potter that um, suck all of the joy out of you. You could kind of create a phantom of some kind, which is then linking into my idea about phantom pain, this kind of invisible creature that's kind of um, a phantom that's um, sucking energy out of you. Um, and again, that links into the idea of the fat leech in the back that's sucking energy out of the rest of the body. So we've got some incredible imagery coming, coming through. I'll just see if there's anything I've missed. Uh, Andrew says, the idea of sound being equated to something physical is interesting. Yes. Um, or um, you could talk about um, a smell, uh, something physical that's happening as being a smell. Um, I often think uh, when I'm writing poems about my amputation, I often think of, it's pretty gross, but the smell of um, cooking flesh. And the reason I think of that, I'm sorry if that has upset anyone, uh, but the reason that I think of that is that as a child, when I was nine and my leg was amputated, I asked if I could keep the leg. And um, I was told that um, some of it had been taken as slices um, to a lab to be analysed and the rest of it had been taken and incinerated as medical waste. <laughs> And so uh, I always had this idea of my um, this this part of me off somewhere burning without me really being able to feel it. Um, and then the other part of me as being in this kind of catalog of slices of of children who had cancer. So I think of you know this kind of amazing filing cabinet full of bits of children, um, which again is quite dark. And I'm sorry if I'm upsetting anyone with that imagery, but. Um, yeah, that, that is quite a fertile kind of um, space for me to sit and think um, about because um, then if I think about what happened to that part of my body that was separate from me, I can link that to things that I'm feeling and experiencing in my body that I am feeling. Um, I can link it to thoughts and, and emotions that I'm having. Uh, Angela is talking about pain as a restrictor. Oh, okay. So yeah, pain is something that's controlling you, restricting you. Um, we are talking a lot about pain. So if there are any of you that are working on um, any other experiences that your body might be having, um, then you might like to tell us if you're writing about, um, you know, the experience of, um, uh, I think I mentioned pregnancy and childbirth. Um, there's some interesting um, words that have been used here. Um, the sea <clears throat> as being gentle or rough, creatures, rocks and seaweed, the weather. Um, you know, you could um, talk about, I haven't actually experienced pregnancy, I've only experienced it as um, a partner of someone who was pregnant, um, but certainly um, that idea of, of um, the weather of something that's constantly changing, um, that if I was writing about pregnancy, that would link into um, the idea of fluid in the womb and um, the idea of uh, uh, the child as, a, as potentially as a creature or an object. Um, there's lots of things, lots of imagery that we could use here if we were talking about, um, I'm just thinking, uh, 
if you are someone who uses some kind of mobility aid, um, there's some imagery here that we could use. Um, for example, the the idea of the tree or the branches. Um, the mobility aid could be um, we could describe it as as an object. So um, from nature or from the world outside us or from space. Um, so when I'm using crutches, I often feel like I'm going to slip at any moment because I'm often using crutches in my um, home environment at night time. So I'm using crutches in the dark, often in with a few lights on in the house, but not enough to see clearly. Um, if there's any water on the floor, then my crutches will slip. That's how I have most of my falls. Um, so I could talk about stumbling through the dark. Um, I could talk about uh, the crutches as, as trees um, without roots to kind of hold me steady in the ground. Um, let's see if anyone else has come, in, come up with any ideas here. We've got Caitlin is saying, a filing cabinet of pain or experiences. Interesting image. What goes where? What do you do with the bits that don't fit neatly into any one category? Yes, wonderful. Uh, and Jack says, Quinn Eads writes a lot about queer birthing and parenting. Awesome. If anyone has any suggestions for poets or writers, um, disabled poets or writers, um, then please do send them through. Um, I can collect those at the end and send through a document with, with those recommendations as well as some of my own. Um, I'm aware of the time. Um, we've been doing this exercise for a while now. Um, so what I'd like you all to do is to take what you've written down um, and use it as, um, as a way to, um, uh, to inspire new words and new vocabulary that you can use in your writing. It doesn't just have to be for poetry. Um, these words would be really useful if you were writing, for example, an article or an essay about your personal experiences and you wanted to find ways to describe pain. Um, even if you were writing something like an article, um, you know, even though we think of that as quite a factual style of writing, um, there is absolutely space in that kind of writing to um, use more poetic descriptions um, of pain or of um, experiences that we're having in our body. Um, the idea of words written on bones, um, falling down a well. You know, if you were trying to write an article about how difficult it is when you live with chronic pain, um, to explain to people that you are always in pain even if you're not screaming all the time, um, then that imagery of falling down a well um, and stopping the screaming but, but still falling, that would be a great image to use in that kind of article or essay. Um, or if you were writing a picture book about disability, then um, something like the words fizz and spit, they jump out at me as being words that would be really good to use in the, um, when describing pain to children. Um, so that would be something that I might use in my own conversations with my kids or in a picture book idea. Um, okay. So I think we'd better move on to the next activity or we'll never have time to do it. Um, so the next thing that I sent out uh, were three writing prompts. Um, so hopefully you all have a copy of your handout now, just holding it up here. Um, the first one, I don't have time to read through all of the pieces with you right now. Um, so if... Um, if you can maybe get one of those open in front of you. If you've read them all, you might know which one is the most interesting to you or the one that you'd like to work with today. Uh, if you haven't read them all, then I'll just quickly describe um, what each of them are. Um, the first one is You by Michelle Roger. This is an incredibly powerful piece of writing um, and I've been recommending it to everyone all the time because it's just... Um, I'll just read a tiny excerpt from it. So this is the beginning. I am a disabled woman. I am a disabled woman. And, oh sorry. I am a disabled woman. And I am disabled by you. Yes, you. You there. You who's looking shocked. You who thinks, oh she can't mean me. You who is starting to feel the slow creep of discomfort and defensiveness. You who see inspiration and bravery before I act or speak a word. You who feel the sharp pang of pity when I cross your line of sight. You who pat me or tell me in a playful voice that I'm 
doing so good. You who think, she doesn't look disabled, she doesn't sound disabled, she doesn't act disabled. You who uses words like overcome and despite when referencing my disability. You who see me and think, if only she could be fixed. You whose first question is, so what's wrong with you? Or what did you do to yourself? You who shares inspiration porn and simply can't see the problem. But it is inspiring. Just look. Okay, so that's an excerpt from that one. And it is a lot of fun to read out loud, so I recommend that you do that at some stage. Um, the second prompt that I've sent out is A Letter to My Younger Self by Stella Young. Um, and I'll just read the beginning of this letter as well. Dear 16-year-old Stella, there are a lot of things I could tell you. I could tell you about moving away from home and all the friends you'll make at university. I could tell you about the completely fantastic career you'll have by the time you're in your early 30s. I could tell you that your life will be exciting and full of wonderful people who love you. All these things are true. But I know what you really want from me. You want to know about sex and love and relationships, not necessarily in that order. So that's what I'm going to tell you about because God knows no one else has anything to offer that can calm your fears. All your worries about love and sex and relationships are reasonable and real. I'd be lying if I told you none of your fears are justified. Let me just delay the strongest of those fears up front. You will have sex, a lot of sex. Relax. Okay, so that's an excerpt from Stella's letter. Um, if you have time to go and have a look at the Ramp Up website um, and read the rest of um, or some, some more of Stella's work, um, I highly recommend it um, because that's been part of my, um, even though I had my leg amputated at nine, I didn't identify as disabled, not strongly, not with an understanding of my community and my peers and role models um, and the history and activism and politics that comes with being disabled. Um, I didn't understand all of that until I started uh, reading uh, work by people like Stella Young. Um, so if you can have a look at the Ramp Up website, that's great. Um, another website I'll just quickly recommend is um, Disability in Kidlit. Even if you are not a children's author, that website is full of great resources. Um, it recommends, it has a, an honour roll of books um, that has good disability rep, um, but it also um, has a lot of uh, articles and Q&As um, and they're really worth reading if you're writing in this, writing in this space. Um, lots of um, good advice about what to do or what not to do when writing disability rep. Um, Anyway, I've gotten a little off track. So uh, that was the second prompt. The third one that I've sent out is, um, a, a, is two quotes together. Um, the first one is from Rosemary Garland Thompson from her book Extraordinary Bodies, Figuring Physical Disability in American Culture and Literature. Most disabled people are surrounded by non-disabled families and communities in which disabilities are unanticipated and almost always perceived as calamitous. Like gays and lesbians, disabled people are sometimes fundamentally isolated from each other, existing often as aliens within their social units. Um, as someone who is both queer and disabled, I really like this quote because I can kind of laugh and go, I'm an alien twice over. Um, it's true in both cases uh, for me, this quote. Um, the second one is from um, Jack's Jackie Brown on the Misandry Hour podcast, which is created by Clementine Ford from March 2016. Um, I really recommend going and having a listen to the whole podcast, um, but this one is from um, about 30 minutes in. As a young person with a disability, it takes a lot of work to try and find mentors, to try and find the disability community, disability pride, and the social model of disability that will eventually allow you to recontextualise those things that you've been brought up to think of as negatives, as sites of intrigue, as positive things, as things that are inherently you and are valuable because of that. So what I'd like you to do is choose one of these writing prompts. Um, you might decide you want to go and have a read of one of the, the pieces in full or all of them in full. Um, we probably won't have time to do that um, in the rest of the webinar, but you might like to do this in your own time. Um, if you choose the first writing prompt, I'd like you just to write a poem or a paragraph or whatever your style is or the type of writing that you'd like to practice and improve um, in response to You by Michelle Roger. Um, 
if you are able-bodied, it might be interesting to write a response to this, um, you know, because Michelle is writing, I guess, not only for disabled readers, but also for um, able-bodied readers, um, writing about um, the fact that uh, people don't necessarily understand what it's like to be disabled. So you might have learned something from reading this poem um, that you then want to respond to, something that you've learned. Um, or if you are disabled, you might like to choose something that Michelle has focused on in this poem and um, expand on it. Um, if you choose writing prompt two, the letter to my younger self, I'd love you to write a letter to your younger self. So you can use that letter as a springboard. You might choose one particular thing in it to um, focus on in your letter, or you might just go, okay, what was I thinking when I was a young disabled person? Or maybe when you were younger, you weren't disabled and you've become disabled since. Um, so what things would you like to tell yourself about what it's like to be a disabled adult? Um, so that's writing prompt two. Writing prompt three, um, I thought for those of you who are writing for young people, um, whether it's picture books or middle grade or YA, um, this idea that it, as a young person it takes a lot of time and work to find your mentors and your community and to find disability pride and the social model, um, the fact that you're often isolated within an environment that's kind of full of able-bodied people, um, I thought this might be a great idea to explore um, uh, to, if you can use this time to write the beginnings of an outline of a character or a plot um, for a book that would help young people, um, young disabled people, to get in touch with those things sooner. So you might write an outline for a picture book that um, explains disability pride to a young person, or you might write an outline for a YA um, that is about um, what it's like to be isolated within a family unit as a disabled person. Um, or you might write a YA about um, the disability community and how a teenager finds their way to that community. Um, so those are my ideas for how you could respond to these prompts, but you might find another way to respond to them and that's fine. Um, I've got here a comment from uh, Jax, I'm currently reading um, Quinn Eade's new poetry book called Rallying, which is amazing. He's not disabled though, that's okay. Um, they will include that recommendation um, in uh, when I send something out at the end. Um, Jax has to head off, um, but we'll catch the rest when it goes up online. So we can all do the same if you wanted to have a look at this or recap anything we've done today, um, then this will be available for you online. So does anyone want to let me know which of these prompts they're most interested in responding to? Or do you have any questions about the prompts? Just wait a little while in case anyone has any questions. Has anyone decided which prompt they'd like to respond to? You might still be reading or having a think. Um, the one that jumps out at me is um, the idea of writing a picture book about disability pride because I think that's a nice simple idea um, to explain to young people or a picture book about the social model of disability, which might be a little bit more complex, but I think it would be amazing to get that idea communicated in a kid-friendly way, um, or even a middle grade novel about the social model of disability. Uh, we've got here, Michelle is saying, the most frustrating thing I find in writing about disability, and Michelle writes essays, is that people often want more information than I'm prepared to give, or they don't seem to understand what I've written, no matter how articulate I am, or how much I write on a subject. I'd love to write more for disabled people. These excerpts have been wonderful for ideas on how to tackle that. So that's, I mean, one of the issues um, when writing um, picture books for mainstream publishers that I've had is that um, 
when I take a manuscript to a publisher about an amputee, they'll say, there aren't enough child amputees to make this worth publishing. And trying to explain that it's not just amputees who would read this story, that in fact the disability community in general love to read stories about all kinds of disabilities. So for example, Pity Took the Train is one of my favourites, even though it's about a wheelchair user. I don't use a wheelchair, but I'm excited and delighted by good representations of disability in picture books. Um, so uh, that was um, the one we held up earlier. I'll just hold it up again in case anyone didn't see it. It's by Nikki Greenberg. Um, and it's got a wheelchair user. And there's even, um, I don't know if you can see uh, in this picture here, one of the teddies at the teddy bear picnic is a wheelchair user as well. Um, so trying to explain to an able-bodied person working in publishing that um, disabled readers in general want good representation of disability can be quite challenging. Um, and sometimes I feel like saying, look, I'm, I'll write this for a disabled audience and, you know, um, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to have an appeal outside of that audience necessarily. But publishers obviously are wanting to sell as many books as possible. So there's always that tension. <coughs> Sorry. Which is why I think it is so important that we have disability-led projects, um, disabled people working in publishing, um, in those kind of gatekeeper roles, because obviously then they'll have a more nuanced understanding of the audience. Um, and also that we have um, things like literary journals that are willing to publish articles, um, essays, poems by disabled people. Um, there's uh, the excerpt that I read, um, I Give a Cosmic Middle Finger, that was published um, by a magazine put out by the Deaf Poet Society. Um, and there are a few kind of um, journals and um, online magazines that are um, written by disabled and edited by disabled people. Um, and then they largely have a disabled audience. Um, and those are important too because we shouldn't always have to make our narratives um, palatable or easy to understand for people without disabilities. Um, even though it is good sometimes when able bodied people can read our writing too because then they have a better understanding of what we're experiencing um, and it can help to resist. It, we can write as a form of resistance to a form of education. Um, we can resist ableism, we can educate people who um, may interact with us in a negative way without that understanding. Um, so all of those things are great reasons for able-bodied people to read our work, but ultimately sometimes we just want to write for people who get it, really get it. Um, so I understand what you're saying, Michelle, um, that people often want more information than you want to give or they don't understand what you've written because they just can't. Um, uh, so here we've got um, three prompt threes, one inspired by all and has already started writing, one prompt two. So there's a group of people here who, uh, there are three of them who have chosen prompt three, um, one inspired by all and one using prompt two. Um, Caitlin says, writing a letter to my younger self feels a bit confronting today. I think I'll try a response to Michelle Rogers' poem instead. And the thing is, that writing about disability, writing about pain, writing about your body, um, all of these things can be quite difficult and confronting um, and any of these activities might be too much for you to handle. If, if you don't feel like you can write about it today, then that's fine. Just take what you've, you've heard and use that um, in your own writing time when you feel safe and comfortable to do that. Um, or you might like to go back to the activity that we were doing before with the excerpts from poetry. If that was feeling, more, if you were feeling more comfortable with that activity, then you could just work on that a bit now. Uh, okay, Caitlin says there's a great poem by Molly Holden called "Pain Teaches Nothing." Um, it's a nifty argument against the idea that we learn or grow through our experience of pain. Yes, I hate this idea of. I mean, yeah, look, I mean. People experience pain in all different kinds of ways, but pain is often used as, as this idea of uh, um, that you're going on some kind of journey and at the end of it, you'll no longer be in pain and you'll have gained something useful, useful from the experience. Whereas for someone with ongoing, potentially lifelong chronic pain, you know, you're not going to get to the end of that journey and my pain doesn't make me feel good. It doesn't 
teach me anything necessarily. It just, yeah, so sometimes trying get, to get people to understand that pain can just be um, a black hole in your back sucking sucking the life out of you or sucking the energy out of you. Um, I think those ideas, those images can be quite helpful um, in communicating to people that it's not necessarily a positive experience. Uh, Carly says, it's really hard when disability pride is constantly debated, yet these people never want to engage with those who support the concept other than to argue and deny that pride exists. Um, yeah, uh, disability pride is an interesting thing because um, when I was a teenager, I um, was instantly kind of embraced by the queer community and um, I understood what LGBTI pride was. There was a, a pride event that we all went to. We were encouraged to feel pride. It was part of our community story, our history. Um, pride was related to resistance and activism as well. Um, but I, there was no, you know, welcoming party or, um, you know, um, and a group of elders to explain or peers to explain what being disabled meant and there was no one telling me that I should be proud to be disabled. Um, I was told to be proud of overcoming disability any time that I seemed um, able-bodied. I was congratulated on, on you know, and, and made to feel pride about the fact that I was, um, that I seemed to have kind of overcome my um, the pain and difficulty that I was experiencing or um, any time that people felt that, yeah, I'd overcome my disability, then I was encouraged to feel pride, but it wasn't the same kind of thing um, that there was with my queerness. There was no celebration of my disability. So I love the idea of a picture book that or a YA novel um, that explains to disabled young people that they have the right to feel proud and, in fact, they should definitely feel proud about their body. Um, any other comments or questions or recommendations? Does anybody want to share uh, if you have started responding to any of the prompts? I know I'm talking constantly, so I hope if you are writing, I'm not interrupting you too much. Um, but there might be those of you who aren't writing yet, so I want to make sure that, um, that we're still engaging with each other. Um, is there any, anyone who has been writing who wants to share a line or a, a few words from what they've written. Um, if you do, just send that through to me in the comments. And if you're happy for me to read it out, um, if you don't want me to read it out, just say at the very beginning, don't read out. <laughs> um, and also I should say, um, uh, because we, we're quite, I think we're probably at the time where some people will have to start logging out of the webinar. Um, if there are those of you who are um, using these writing prompts or um, using the, the first activity we did where we brainstormed vocabulary, if you want to send that through to me on email, um, I'm very happy to have a conversation with you about it, to provide any feedback if you're interested in that, um, or just to say, awesome, this is great, um, and to kind of share and celebrate the fact that you've written something that's come out of this webinar. Um, so I will... Write down my email address. That's I don't know if that's the most useful way to do it. It is. It is long. Okay, we can forward it to you apparently. So we'll do that. But I'll also just, in case anyone wants to take it down now, that's my email address. Um, so if you'd like to have a conversation or send through some work, and. Um, and get some feedback. All right. There we go. Okay. So we will send that out if anyone didn't get that down. Uh, Alex says, is there an expectation that writing about disability focuses on the negatives and ignores the positives? Um, I should take this chance to... Okay, so I, in response to that, um, definitely I don't think writing about 
disability or pain focuses on negatives and ignores positives. Um, as I said, I'd love to see a picture book about disability pride. Um, there is a lot of positive. There are a lot of positives to focus on. It could be you could write about the way that um, we might see the world or experience the world differently. Um, you might write about the community or the pride. Um, I've got one here about my phantom pain, which is um, me exploring my positive feelings about phantom pain, um, and it uses those. Um, when I was doing some brainstorming earlier and talking about cookie cutters and outlines, um, I used that the other day to kind of put together this idea. Um, and I've done some previous writing about this as well. So I've spent 20 years trying to fix my broken outline, filling the part that's missing with metal and plaster and rubber toes and fake weird skin. But it's not me, not really. And besides, the part isn't really missing. It's not even missed. If I took all of that crap away right now, I'd still be whole. I'd still exist beyond the edges of my physical fleshy stump anyway. A phantom limb tickles and tingles. I'm here, she whispers. Still here, we roar together. I exist beyond the edges of my body. How incredible. What other parts of me might be floating just beyond the edges waiting for me to find them? How limiting outlines are. I'll spread out, I'll expand, I'll tingle and hurt and merge with the air and the floor and the wall and you. Watch out, I'm growing places. Um, so that's an early draft, so please forgive me, but um, what I'm trying to say is that I also explore um, something like pain as um, a potentially positive thing in my life. Um, you can use positive imagery like the idea of growing and expanding, um, existing beyond the edges of your body. Uh, this is me trying to explain that phantom pain isn't just a negative experience or sensation. Um, uh, Michelle says, agree it's hard when people misunderstand what you've written or that your truth isn't necessarily their truth and that's actually okay. We are a diverse bunch and won't always see eye to eye within the community. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, the, the idea of our community and how diverse we are is something that's difficult for some able-bodied people to understand because the representation is so um, limited that um, able-bodied people might only very occasionally come into contact with um, representations of disability that are written by disabled people. So um, they may only be seeing, you know, one representation of one kind of disability every now and then. And it may be that when they do read it, they're reading a stereotyped um, if, if they're reading something by an able-bodied writer, they might be reading about a stereotype or a, um, a bad. They might be reading a bad representation, and so that might colour the way that they see disability. Um, so the more writing by disabled people we get out there, the more representation we have across all forms and genres, whether that be picture books or poetry or sci-fi novels. Um, the more that readers, um, able-bodied readers, will um, get a more um, nuanced version, a nuanced understanding of our community and how diverse we are, and the more chance there is that a disabled reader will find someone who um, is experiencing their disability in the same way or will see themselves represented on the page. Um, yeah, the idea that your truth isn't necessarily um, their truth. Um, certainly I've read representations of disability that I don't identify with and ones that I do. Um, and yeah, as I said, that's why it's important to have a real diversity of stories out there to reflect the reality of the diversity of the community. I think we all know that, but it's just hard sometimes to actually write about our bodies and to get it out there and published. Um, so yeah, we've, we, there's, there are structural issues that need to be, structural inequalities that need to be addressed within publishing. Um, but also we just need to keep writing and getting it out there um, so that other people out there can see. As soon as I read these poems about pain, for example, I felt inspired to try and write about my own pain. Um, and that's what writing by disabled writers can do, is help empower us to actually tell our stories and tell them in our ways and get them out there. So the more writing there is, the more um, disabled people will be um, inspired and empowered to write their own stories. Uh, we've got here, Michelle says, 
it's so important to get loads of disabled voices out there. A lot of people tend to think that because they've read one narrative, they know what it's like to be disabled. The same with, um, uh, for example, you know, festival programming. You might have one disabled person that's kind of on a on a one panel in one festival, and people think, okay, we've got disability rep. Or um, if someone's putting together an anthology of stories and they're kind of ticking off the diversity that's represented in that anthology, they might think, okay, we've got one disabled writer, therefore, you know, disability is kind of represented in this anthology. But um, you know, that leads to this idea of the single narrative of the, the, one, the one voice, the one story, and that, that can be damaging. Um, we need a diversity of voices. Does anyone want to share anything that they've written? Um, or I can read um, some other writing that's come out of I did the exercise that we did at the beginning on my own at home and used it to um, to write some poetry. So if anyone wants to hear any of that, um, or does anyone have any other recommendations for books or poets um, that we should all be having a look at? We can add that to our list. Oh, here we go. Um, Michelle says I've often found LGBT pride a lot easier to embrace myself. At 36, I've only embraced disabled pride for the last three years or so since I started writing. Yeah, that's been the same for me. I've been disabled since I was nine and um, I'm now um, 32. No, 32. 32. And it's only in the last few years that I've really started to understand um, my own disabled identity and to feel disabled pride. Um, and that's really been because of reading the writing of disabled writers. So that's the other thing. It doesn't, reading, disabled readers reading disabled writing, um, it doesn't just prompt us to write. It also helps us to understand our own identity and to kind of link in, connect in with ideas like the social model um, and the disabled community. I realise we're at... 12.30, so I don't know whether we need to um, wrap things up soon, but does anyone have anything that they would like to share? Any questions or, or comments? Um, anything that they found particularly useful or not useful today? Um, or if you'd like to share a little, I know you might be scared to share something that you've written, but I would love to see um, a few sentences from people's writing before we go. Uh, Caitlin says, this has been great. Hey. Thank you all so much for coming. This is the first time I've ever um, taught a, a webinar. Um, and it is a little difficult not having kind of verbal feedback from people. Um, but uh, it's been really good. I hope it's been good for you. It's been interesting for me. Um, Caitlin says that she's playing around with the question mark idea. Great. I love that idea. Um, maybe if no one's, oh, hold on, Alex from Ballarat says, it's been awesome, first, first webinar for several here and it's been great. Oh, good. Um, oh, thank you so much, Kate. Um, I, I won't read out any more compliments, I feel. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll just quickly finish up by talking about the, we, we talked about, um, or I mentioned Plath's tulips. Um, so I'll just... This is again just something I've written the other day, um, but I was thinking about how difficult it is to communicate pain. Someone talked about the idea of screaming down the well um, and the fact that you're still falling even when you stop screaming. I've got here, um, I've always loved Plath's red tulips, dangerous animals invading the whiteness of the hospital room. I'm not in hospital anymore, but when the pain hits, I imagine my clothes are all white and the pain is a red circle blooming brightly, seeping, spreading, growing bigger as it flowers, a wound there under my shirt for all to finally see. No trying to explain, no sceptical looks, 
no one telling me it's probably nothing or I just need to think positively. I'll turn my back to them and they'll gasp in horror. My back a sea of violent, angry, hungry tulips opening their mouths and screaming silently. The roots are in my SI joint, down through my left glute, into my stump. That's where the pain draws its nourishment from, from the exhausted muscles that work even as they waste away. As I stand with my back to the doctor and my boss and anyone else who cares to wonder if the pain is all a lie, they can't see my eyes victorious in agony, my own mouth opening, screaming like a black hole swallowing the whole universe. So that's using some of the imagery from the different poems, the idea of roots, because I was thinking about the tree poem, the idea of the black hole, um, the idea of uh, the tulips and the mouth, the tulips opening like a mouth. Um, so hopefully all of you will have a chance to use what we've talked about today to inspire your own poetry and writing and please do feel free to send it through because I would love to um, continue this conversation. Um, I'll just make sure there are no other comments or questions that we should read out. Okay. Great. Sounds like everyone's had a good time. Thank you so much for being here and coming along. This is my, as I said, my first webinar and it's been an amazing experience. So thank you so much. Oh good, it says stopped. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That was amazing. Oh. <laughs>